exactly. <laughs> so we will be looking, of course, at some uh, doctrinal terms and, you know, looking at the Buddha's words and trying to understand them. But I also want these classes to be an opportunity, these discussions to be an opportunity for us to see how they apply in our lives, you know, to come up with some examples from your own life and to um, just apply it to the teachings or see how the teachings can help to uh, perhaps refine some of your actions of body, speech and mind and, and just align them more fully with the noble path. So for me personally, when I started reading the suttas, it was when I started reading them in any sort of depth, it was probably a 10 years into my practice, although I had studied some Pali before that. And, you know, I had a sort of general overview. But because I came to it more through the practice, um, as my practice deepened, my understanding of the teachings also deepened and the two started to sort of reinforce each other. So the understanding would reinforce the depth of the practice and the practice would then open up things that I hadn't yet seen in the Buddha's words. So it's a really beautiful process when we do start to have that personal connection with the texts, because for me, that's also when the Buddha starts to become a spiritual friend. Yeah. We might have our little um, community groups, our Dhamma groups that we go to and we have personal spiritual friendships there. We might have our teachers who are like our Kalyanamittas, our spiritual friends, maybe people who we have great confidence in that have seen the Dhamma, if we're very fortunate. But very few of us feel the same depth of connection with the Buddha himself, I think, because he lived so long ago, right? We don't have the chance to sit down and have a conversation and to allay our doubts or to open up, you know, discussions that are pertinent to our lives. But once we start reading the texts, we start to get this sense that actually the Buddha is speaking to us. You know, he's speaking to the human condition, to the human mind. And that human mind, that human condition hasn't changed in probably eternity, maybe eons, who knows? So they are very relevant. Um, but it just takes sometimes a little bit of unpacking. And I'm super excited to see how many people are here today. It's really nice that you wanted to come. So this is the book that I um, mentioned that we would be using. And I'm not sure how many of you have copies. Maybe we could have a little show of hands or books. Wow, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. <laughs> really nice to see all the books flashing up. If you don't have it, don't worry. I said uh, in the little blurb that it doesn't really matter because I'll be reading out anyway in hopefully in bite-sized pieces. Um, but if you do want to come to more, more of these sessions, then I recommend getting this book. One thing that I noticed today when I looked through the first three few paragraphs is that um, each one is only a tiny excerpt from a bigger sutta. And of course, being inquisitive, I want to know the context for that passage. So, you know, each one, you could then go back and read the original sort of from where it's taken. So I hope that although we can't go into full depth with each and every sutta, um, it might be inspiring for you to start to read the bigger texts. So, for example, the first few are from this book, Majjhima Nikaya, you see that's much bigger than this. So... Who knows, you might end up going and getting that. And Hanukkah's also got the connected discourses, the Samyutta Nikaya there. So that's great as well. Yeah. And I know that Gunther's got a lot. He showed me a photo of his bookcase and it's like, wow, packed with uh, all the Tipitaka books and also lots of other Dhamma books from Ajahn Brahm and other teachers. So. so good. So these sessions are a bit different from my usual sessions because they don't include a meditation. Um, if we include meditation, they'll have to be twice as long. Um, so I'll probably get straight into the texts. But what we'll do is give you an opportunity to raise your hands during the session, not only at the end. So and to give me a chance to to sort of contemplate what I'm reading, I might indicate, you know, certain times when I'll invite questions or comments, yeah? So I'll do a little bit and then sort of say, 
does anyone want to you know say anything and it doesn't have to be you know academic or clever or anything like that it can just be um, a reflection maybe about your life your practice or even just how you feel having heard that reading you know, sometimes things touch us in a certain way and sometimes we object we think that that can't be right that sounds you know really strange that's not my understanding and this is a place for you to bring all of that forward yeah so perhaps we should just pause and say hello to each other because we haven't done that so if you'd like to <laughs> please write in the chat box, especially I'd like to hear from you if it's your first time to any of my sessions. I do notice a few people that I don't recognize and it's always nice to know. Uh, there's also a lot of you that come regularly that I know very well. But if it is your first time to one of these sessions, please just say your name and where you're calling in from. And anyone can write, not only the newbies. We cannot write to the whole group. Oh, uh-huh. So it seems that the function for writing a message to the whole group is not there. That's strange. Maybe we've put a certain setting on. Hmm. I don't know if Mel can help. Maybe we can't. Ah, I think you can now. Yeah, now you can. Great. All right, well, I'll let you do that. From Boston, from Doncaster, Germany. Excellent. And maybe while you're typing, I can ask for some hands. So if anybody hasn't been here before and you have your video on, maybe you can stick your hand up. I can. Emma, hi. Emma's first time. Kath is first time as well. Yay! <laughs> Anyone else? Not all of you have. Oh, Roberta, yeah, your first time? Yeah, great. At least three, anyway. And if I haven't seen you, then you're warmly welcome to. Good. All right. Shall we start? You're raring to go. <laughs> All right. So, <clears throat> so this is the first chapter in this book, and the excerpt is from Majjhima Nikaya one one seven, which is called the Mahachatari Sakasutta, or the Great Forty. So. I'll just start reading. And I'm going to change the word monks. And if it ever says women or men, I'm going to change that too to make it gender inclusive. Okay. But in this case, he's talking to the monastics. So I'll say monastics. Monastics, right view comes first. And how does right view come first? One understands wrong view as wrong view and right view as right view. This is one's right view. So that sounds very simple. The first step to right view is simply understanding right view is right view and wrong view is wrong view. So this involves a little bit of discernment straight away. Then he goes on, and what is wrong view? There is nothing given, nothing sacrificed, nothing offered. There's no fruit or result of good or bad actions. There is no this world, no other world. There is no mother, no father, no beings spontaneously reborn. There are in this world no aesthetics Brahm and Brahmins of right conduct and right practice who, having realized this world and the other world for themselves by direct knowledge, make them known to others. This is wrong view. Then he says, and what is right view? Right view, I say, is twofold. There is right view that is affected by the influxes, sometimes translated as taints, 
the Pali word there is asawa. Um, my teacher, Adrian Brown, likes to translate that as outgoing. Some people say influxes, but I'll explain that in a bit. In common, sorry, outgoings, and some people say, in, uh, how do they call it? Inflowings or something? I forget now. But it's just a matter of whether the mind flows out with craving into the world or whether the, the sort of defilements, we perceive them as coming in. So either way, you can interpret that one. So right view, I say, is twofold. There is right view that is affected by the influxes or the taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions. And there is right view that is noble, free from influxes, supra mundane, and a factor of the path. So I'm going to pause here already because there's already quite a lot. So the idea here is that the right view in the beginning, the preliminary right view, if you like, that's affected by influxes, partaking of merit, ripening the acquisitions, is the right view of somebody who's not yet an area. So they've not yet broken through to stream entry. Yeah. So that's most probably all of us. And the other right view is sometimes called super mundane right view. And that's the right view of somebody who's actually seen non-self. They've seen the Four Noble Truths. And at that point, it becomes a factor of the path in the sense that the right view becomes so established that it guides the rest of the path. It acts almost like, um, like, like a kind of guide that ensures that your journey is on the right track. Yeah. Before you actually break through to that kind of right view, right view acts more like a map. So it gives us a sense of the territory. It gives us sort of instructions and a, and a context for the practice. And some of it we take slightly on faith. Um, but as we cultivate the rest of the path, our right view um, becomes purified. And in that sense, the preliminary right view um, guides the other factors to their maturity. But it's when the other factors come to maturity, especially you know, practicing the whole Eightfold Path, including Samadhi, that we actually have a chance for the right view to become liberating right view. Yeah. So it's almost like the Eightfold Path is not a linear thing. I mean, it does go in sequence, but it also folds back on itself. So you practice the whole thing, first of all, not as a noble person, right? So we have a preliminary understanding, a basic understanding, basically about cause and effect and about suffering and the fact that there's a way out of suffering. We have that basic sense, that basic view. Sometimes we take it a little bit on faith. Other times we have a certain amount of understanding or maybe intuition about that, but some enough for it to give us confidence to take the next step, to take the um, successive step. So that preliminary right view informs then right intention, you know, because beings suffer, because we suffer, and because there's a cause of that suffering, then we care to take more, uh, more care about our intentions. Yeah, because we understand karma, we understand that there is um, an effect of our actions of body, speech, and mind. We take more care about the way we use our mind, the way we speak to others, you know, the way, the kind of livelihood maybe that we pursue, because we know that has an effect and we care about, you know, bringing around happiness and well being for ourselves and others. We don't want to cause suffering in this world. So there are these two types of right view. And we have to start at least with what is sometimes translated as mundane right view or preliminary right view. So then he goes into more detail here. And what is right view? This is the preliminary right view. What is right view that is subject to influxes, partaking of merit and ripening in acquisitions? Should I unpack that sentence first? <laughs> it's quite technical, isn't it? Okay. So right view subject to the influxes. Again, I was mentioning that that is sometimes translated as taints. So you could say they're a type of defilement. And the three uh, influxes or asawas in Pali are um, 
bhavasara, which is the craving to be, or the um, mind that sort of leans into being, becoming, existing. Kamasara, which is like um, the craving for sensuality. Yeah, the mind that goes out into the sensual world or that perhaps picks up objects in the sensual world and reacts with um, sensuality. So we're increasing our sensual desire. And the other one is avijasa, which is basically delusion. Um, and it says in the Majjhima Nikaya number nine, in the big book, <laughs> which is the Samaditi Sutta, that all of these asawas are basically caused by delusion. So even the asawa, which is the asawa of delusion, is caused by delusion. So it's like in the commentaries, it says that um, delusion in a previous existence causes delusion in this existence. And delusion in this existence, you know, leads to delusion in the next. So it's kind of a cycle of negative reinforcement. The more deluded we are, the more likely we are to, the more difficult it is in a sense to come out of that flow of delusion, right? Because our basic understanding of the world is incorrect to start with. But the Buddha also says that there's no um, beginning point of delusion. It can't be discovered. There's no discernible point where it began because there are so many lives, so many existences. It's impossible to find the beginning. So he's not so much concerned with beginnings. He's more concerned with um, how to end this process, yeah? how to cut through these asawas and become free from the asawas. So basically, these are things that we have, unless we're um, at least a stream winner. And then, yeah, a stream winner's cut through delusion, but they haven't cut through all sensuality at that point. So they get refined between those stages, between the stream winning, the first stage of enlightenment and the arahat, the full enlightenment. And then the next one, what is right view that's subject to the influxes partaking of merit? So that basically means that anything you do at this point on your path, because you have this um, sense that there's a being there, your actions will have effects for you. There will be results of good and bad karma. You will be there to receive those results of good and bad karma. Right? So it partakes in merit because it's still not beyond the sensual sphere it will still result in certain um, experiences in the human realm or in another realm. Yeah, it's still within the round of existence. And then the last one says ripening in the acquisitions. And according to the notes in that sort of, it says the acquisitions are like the five candles. So it ripens in the acquisitions means it ripens in having again a body, um, a body, a mind, yeah feeling, perception, consciousness, and will, if you like, sankara, yeah? So this kind of right view, in other words, doesn't take you out of samsara. It doesn't take you out of the round of rebirth. It keeps you in there, but we try to start refining it so that the results of our karma are good ones, right? So that we move towards making good karma and um, gaining merits rather than demeritorious deeds. So the next sentence follows on from that. So right view is that there is what is given, sacrificed and offered. There is fruit and result of good and bad actions. There is this world and another world. There is mother and father. There are beings spontaneously reborn. There are in the world ascetics and Brahmins of right conduct and right practice who having realized this world and the other world for themselves by direct knowledge make them known to others. This is right view that is subject to influxes, partaking of merit and ripening in the acquisitions. So the person still has a sense of self here and they still, um, you know, like all of us, we still want to do good and to experience good results of our body, speech and mind, right? We're still interested in improving our lives and and doing the right thing. And um, I always wondered, you know, why does it say there's mother and father, there are aesthetics and Brahmins? I could never understand that. I thought that was very obvious. But then it occurred to me that the reason it says this is because mother, father, and also aesthetics and Brahmins are fields of merit. Yeah? They're people who we have 
gratitude and respect towards. So we already start to develop these beautiful qualities of gratitude and respect, which are our good karma, right? We're uplifting our heart already. We're already being able to engage with the world in a very positive way. And because of that, you know, we understand that, um, for example, harming one's mother and father is incredibly bad karma. You know, they actually say that if you kill your mother, which I'm sure most of us haven't, I hope, um, you can't become liberated, you can't become enlightened. It's such a severe, um, terrible deed that it puts a huge obstacle in your way of enlightenment. So I don't think you can never become enlightened, but not in this life anyway. Um, whereas the opposite is also true. So they say, you know, that the mother and father have given you so much that you can never repay your debt of gratitude. And I know that that can be difficult for people who've maybe been in very, um, you know, abusive, had abusive parents or have a lot of trauma in their childhood to understand that the mother and the father could be, you know, people who we must have gratitude towards. And I, I do think there's an exceptions in, in those cases, but still at the very least, you know, they've given us our life and we have an opportunity. We, we can't say, we didn't have a control about how we were raised, whether it was in a loving way, in a safe way, in a, or in a neglectful way, but still we have the human life and there are ways that we can, um, develop ourselves on the path and there are opportunities for us to um, respond to whatever we're given and and uh, in, in either a positive or a negative way in a way that leads to more suffering or in a way that starts to bring us out of suffering so I think that's here why it talks about those particular beings and then of course there's a very clear reference to rebirth right here which is worth pointing out because some people say that, you know, you don't need to believe in rebirth or that rebirth is not part of the early Buddhist teachings. And I think the first sentence is true. We don't need to believe in rebirth. But I do think it's important to keep an open mind to it because the Buddha here is clearly saying that there is this world and another world, right, and the other world. So it also means that with this karma, it has effects not only in this life, our actions, body, speech and mind have effects now, that we can feel, that we can experience here, even as we do them sometimes. But it also has effects for us in future lives. So the implications are much wider than just this life, just this one life. And that can give us a lot of courage and a lot of um, patience as well with the process, understanding that nothing goes waste. No step on this path goes waste, right? So he's saying here, you know, at least for preliminary right view, at least we have a sense that there could be another world. And Ajahn Brown put it very nicely on one of his talks recently. Somebody said, I don't have faith. Do I have to have faith in, in rebirth? And he said, no, that's fair enough. You don't have to, but please don't have faith in that there is no rebirth. Don't have faith in that, right? The whole point of this path is that it's to be experienced by the wise. It's to be experienced, it's to be, um, walked upon, it's to be, um, I wouldn't say analysed, but investigated, yeah, with an open mind, with a mind of integrity, not having already come to conclusions before we've begun. And of course, if we can sort of take on faith or in confidence or through a sense of intuition that there could be um, this life and other lives, then I do think it expands the whole idea of why we practice, the whole scope of this practice also, to take us out of suffering of birth and death, not just this birth and our death that's coming up, but all birth and death, yeah? The cycle of existence, the samsara that keeps on going round and round and round. Like the Buddha actually said, if you could look at the blood you've shed in the lives, it would be more than the water in the oceans, yeah? the blood from having your head cut off. It sounds quite gory, right? I think he says the, the oceans, but the other one with the oceans is the tears that you've shed would come to more than the water in, in the four. Is it the four oceans? Yeah, there's four, aren't there? Is that right or five? There's four oceans, Atlantic, Pacific, Antarctica, other Arctica. It's a five or four. 
<laughs> anyway, that's probably what the Buddha would call a useless question. <laughs> but uh, I'm pretty sure he said there were four. Anyway, that's a lot of tears that you've shed. And so teachings like this don't have such an impact if you don't believe in future lives, right? It's not going to shock you in the same way. It's not going to propel you on the path with quite the same uh, commitment, I think. So for me personally, I always had a sense there must be many lives. I don't know why, but I remember before I ordained, I thought, just this life, I'll give to that. It's only one life. At least I can commit to it for this life. You know, whatever happens, I'll just give this one life a go. Okay. So that's the bit on right view. And I see that somebody has their hand up. So um, I'll pause there before we get into the next paragraph. So Stefano has his hand up. Could we unmute him? Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. <laughs> nice to meet you. I've, I've already joined the um, meditation, but I'm very, very happy you're, you're doing this now. And, uh, and so thank you very much. First of all, and then uh, I just have a question around around Nibbana or Parinibbana, and because I'm sure you've been asked many, many times, <laughs> but I've been uh, I've been practicing Theravada Buddhism for mm -hmm. many, many years, and and uh, I really I really like it, and I've been uh, I've been a monk as well, a bhikkhu cool for a few months in Oxford. So I'm really yeah, because so I wanted to deepen my practice. I really like it, but mm. I've always had problems with. Uh, with Parinibbana, with the idea, because I, I can relate intellectually. I mean, the, I'm not enlightened, so uh, I think we should practice to purify our mind just without thinking too much. And I can see, you know, I've met so many people, I've seen people's life change, improving. So, but the idea of kind of dis disappearing as the final goal. Yeah. I've always had trouble with that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Because it may... Oh, somebody's up muted you. Sorry, I can't hear you anymore. Hello. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. It, just is, um, is that the main question? Should we? Yeah. Shall I? Yeah. Okay. okay. It makes me think like, okay, this life is just uh unfortunate that we're here and you know and um and the yeah. house is on fire but i'm gonna leave yeah yeah, yeah yeah okay yeah. okay Thank you very yeah much. yeah so i think i mean it's a big question and you know i'm also not enlightened so i can't tell you but what i have seen of the path so far is that the more we disappear the more happy we become the more happiness there is because what will we disappear what's disappearing Dis what's disappearing is craving and, and that's the source of suffering, right? So the more that craving disappears, the more that we disappear in a sense, but all that's really disappearing is suffering, yeah. So I think it's only really possible to appreciate how disappearance can be bliss if we understand the scope and pervasiveness of suffering. Hmm? If we think, oh, this bit of life's suffering, but this bit of life's quite good, or this kind of sensation's you know, unhappy, unpleasant, but this kind of sensation's pleasant, it's wonderful, it's great, bring it on. Then of course, we don't want to let go, but, but the more we realize that all experience, all sensations, all perception, all even consciousness is actually suffering, then the less we're worried <laughs> about disappearing from this conditioned realm. Yeah. And, and the thing is, I think the carrot, if you like, like you say about when, well, then what's the meaning or, you know, well, should we just reject this life? It doesn't work like that because the more we disappear, the more happiness arises. And it's a different kind of happiness that's not based on um, craving. It's not based on the fuel of existence. It's actually based on letting go more and more. So, for example, just in a very simple way, when you meditate, at first the sensations are very intense or, you know, discomforting, you know, they're hard to bear. And after you sit and you make peace, you make peace, things start to soften in the body and mind, right? Or maybe mentally you've got a lot of thoughts going around and you're just on this kind of horrible train that's 
digging you deeper and deeper into a hole of suffering. And after a while, you sort of see through that and you're just able to pause and let go and get into a space which is quieter. And, and wow, suffering's, uh, the, the, it's almost like the cessation of suffering um, happens simultaneously with the arising of happiness. So the more we can let go, the more what we call the natural process just, just arises. And if we're really, this is the importance of sila as well. If we're really rooted in virtue, <clears throat> if our back practice is based on the foundation of virtue, living a virtuous life becomes a source of great pleasure too. And for me, I understand, I guess, my existence as just an opportunity to do good in this world, you know? to disappear from suffering as much as I can, to relinquish control, to relinquish craving, to let go and to experience like a purer kind of happiness and joy that arises through meditation, but also then to share these teachings with others and to you know, start to refine my behavior of body and speech in particular to bring about more happiness for others. So the precepts are not only a restraint, but they're also a positive action that we can put into this world and we can help others also experience a different kind of happiness. So it's not that by letting go of suffering and by getting out of some side, there's nothing left. There's actually happiness of a different kind. And it just takes a bit of time to start tuning into that because at first it's, it's much subtler and it seems perhaps even scary that there's not enough me there. But the more we just do it in bits, you know, in little bits and little bits, we get more confidence to let go a little bit more and so, yeah, I mean, obviously, when we think of the whole picture, it might seem frightening, but if we can just stay with the bit we're at and just keep on teaching the mind, showing the mind, look, mind, when I just let go of that little bit or when I just let things be, I stop fighting with my experience, look, mind, there's a bit more, there's a bit more peace and get a taste for that peace, you know, start reconditioning yourself in that direction. So, yeah, I hope that um, helps. So... I like to stay on the subject of right view. Um, is there anything else on what we've already mentioned on this so-called preliminary right view before we go on to the uh, super mundane right view? Is that something? Um, may I ask a quick question? Yes. I think I was doing something hosty and I, I missed the interpretation. So it's on what we've just been talking about. I just wanted to understand what do you mean by the ripening in the acquisitions? Okay, so ripening in the acquisitions, according to the commentaries, means that it ripens in this world with more, um, with another body. Yeah, so this is the kind of right view that doesn't take you out of existence altogether. It doesn't take you out of samsara just yet. It ripens, and in the commentaries it says, five, in the five candors. So the five candors are like the body, right? The body candor or form, and then Vedana feeling, uh, Sanya perception, <clears throat> Sankara, which is like volition or will, and consciousness. So it will ripen, hopefully in a positive way, because it's right view, it will ripen in a good way. It might ripen even in a fortunate rebirth. It might ripen in happiness in this life, but it's still within samsara so that's why it's still an acquisition you're still not beyond um the material realms yeah good so i'm going to go on to the next bit so we talked about the mundane one which is what most of us will be cultivating right now and seeing you know how we can make merit how we can make good karma by being kind to all beings and especially our mother and father and maybe supporting ascetics and brahmins including bhikkhunis Ha. And, uh, and the nice thing also that I noticed recently is that even in traditional Buddhist cultures where it's uh, ingrained in that psyche to support the Sangha, and by Sangha I mean monastic Sangha, I've known, I, I read a report in uh, an Insight article, what's it called, Insight Myanmar, about the Burmese situation right now, and it was very beautiful because some of the monks were also coming into the streets, but they weren't protesting, they were feeding the protesters. And it said, isn't this interesting? This is going against the stream because the normal way, 
is for the lay people to feed and make sure the monastic sangha have everything they need. But here the monks were actually giving food, they were giving water to the protesters. So even in a Buddhist culture, you know, where this is taken fairly literally, it's obviously wider than that. We can make merit, so to speak, just in what is merit it's not brownie points <laughs> it's not like oh I want to get like better kind of bang for my box it's actually the joy in the heart the beauty the nobility of the heart when you perform wholesome actions when you help to free others from suffering which includes protecting life so like I said about the sealer can be like abstinence from killing but it also has to be the positive attribute as well positive aspect which would be not only not to kill but to protect to guard to nurture to treasure life so that's what's happening there people are really protecting each other and it's, it's incredibly inspiring to see that so the next part is talking about the right view of somebody who's attained stream winning so somebody who is bound for nibbana so it says, and what is right view that is noble, free of influxes? So they don't have this um, wish to for existence and the, the ignorance, the delusion or the um, sensuality. Right? Supramundane and a factor of the path. So this is when right view really becomes a path factor, like really right view, not just preliminary, but a, a power yeah, it becomes one of the enlightenment factors at this point because it guides the path correctly. Yeah, it keeps you on course and there's no way that you can ever go off course once you've attained to right view. You know, one that's attained to right view can never have wrong view again. So they can never again believe in a sense of self. Yeah, they can never again believe that um, there is, I mean, this is hard to say, and which is why I wasn't necessarily going to give sort of classes to the group straight away but yes they can never believe that there's any happiness to be found in this world they've seen through suffering to its entirety so then it further explains wisdom the faculty of wisdom the power of wisdom the investigation of states enlightenment factor the path factor of right view in one whose mind is noble one whose mind is without influxes, one who possesses the noble path and is developing the noble path. This is the right view that is noble, free from influxes, super mundane and a factor of the path. So it's not just the path anymore, the eightfold path, it's the eightfold noble path at this point. So this is very inspiring. And I wanted to just go into another sutta, which gives a bit more explanation about how that actually looks and how we can practice for that. And this is the Kosambia Sutta. So I've left myself a little note there. Page 421. <laughs> We're gonna need to do this book for the next 10 years, aren't we? But I think it's better that we Look at this thoroughly. Okay. So this is um, the right view that's become established. This is how we practice it, okay. So this is a Kasambia Sutta, number 48 of the Majjhima Nikaya, if you want to check it out. And how does this view that is noble and emancipating lead the one who practices in accordance with it to the complete destruction of suffering? So how does it work? Here, a monastic or a lay person gone to the forest or to the root of a tree or to an empty heart considers thus, is there any obsession unabandoned in myself that might so obsess my mind that I cannot know or see things as they actually are? If a monastic is obsessed by sensual lust, then their mind is obsessed. If they're obsessed by ill will, then their mind is obsessed. If they're obsessed by sloth and torpor, the mind is obsessed. If they're obsessed by restlessness and remorse, then their mind is obsessed. 
If they're obsessed by doubt, then their mind is obsessed. If one is absorbed in speculation about this world, then their mind is obsessed. If one is absorbed in speculation about the other world, then their mind is obsessed. You know what it's like, you sit down and the mind's like, oh, is there, is there any end to this world? What's happening in Burma? What's happening, you know, all over the place? What's happening with my rent or the landlord wants to sell the house? Oh, meditation, back to my breath. <laughs> or yeah, even is the Nibbana, is it a real thing? What is it, you know? All of this kind of stuff obsesses the mind. And the others of, of course, the five hindrances, which stop us entering samadhi. If a bhikkhu takes to quarreling and brawling and is deep in disputes, stabbing others with verbal daggers, then their mind is obsessed. So right view comes in. One understands thus, there is no obsession unabandoned in myself that might so obsess my mind that I cannot know and see things as they actually are. In other words, my mind is free from hindrances now. My mind is well disposed for awakening to the truths. That's the Four Noble Truths, yeah? Because in other suttas it says, samadhi pachaya yata bhuta jnana dasana. So it's samadhi. It's the samadhi states that are possible when we abandon the five hindrances that gives us a chance to see things as they really are. So then we have a chance to awaken to the noble truth. This is the first knowledge attained by him or her or them that is noble, super mundane and not shared by ordinary people. So the first knowledge of right view is the four noble truths, awakening to the four noble truths. So in the Dhammachaka Sutta, this is what happened when uh, the Buddha gave that discourse, the venerable Anya Kondanya, he became a stream winner because he saw uh, into the Four Noble Truths. And of course, the Buddha also talked about the Four Noble Truths straight away in that very first sermon and, and in 12 ways. So it's not just that you understand there's suffering, there's a cause of suffering, there's an end and there's a path. It's also, for example, in the first one, the Buddha says that one knows the suffering and suffering has to be understood completely. Parinyatabam means it should be understood completely. Pari is like all around in its entirety fully. Yeah, a parameter, I suppose. I don't know, it comes from our English words, pari, very similar to that. So parinyatabam, and then the third way is it has been understood. So each of these noble truths, it's a concept at first, but then later it's penetrated directly through our own experience. Mm -hmm. So we have to actually understand these things through experience. So that means we actually see suffering in its entirety. We understand all our experience of suffering and we actually see it cease. We don't just know that it can cease, but it actually ceases at that moment of um, the penetration of the Four Noble Truths. Because when you see that something's suffering, you don't really wanna hold on to it anymore it's like when the mind really sees that it will let it go but we think it's not suffering we think there's still something there that's you know that that we can make something out of you know like sometimes you get into like nice experiences in meditation you think great this is it i've arrived but hey guess what it all falls apart and you come out of even meditation and somebody sort of says something to you that is really unpleasant and you know you're back in suffering again another experience that i used to have a lot uh, <coughs> practicing vipassana meditation observing sensations is that i'd have a lot of um you would focus very much on the impermanence of those sensations to the point where they were just not really there they were just arising and passing so quickly that there was nothing really to hold and sometimes they'd be very pleasant you know sort of pleasant but actually, it wasn't pleasant because there's this constant arising and passing. It's like even the most pleasant sensation actually feels like an agitation in the mind. And this really helped me in my monastic life leading up, sorry, in my life, practice life leading up to monasticism. 
because even as a meditator sometimes you know something happens you might meet somebody and there's all these feelings of love and I remember this happening to me before I was wanting to ordain actually a long time before I did ordain because I tried to run away from that <laughs> but you know there were these so-called pleasant experiences and I just felt it like almost like an intoxication like extremely um how can we call it like something dangerous in disguise, something that could take me away from my path and get me really intoxicated if I wasn't careful. So I'm not saying nobody should have relationships, but for me, I, I was already set on ordaining, it was set on that goal. And I'd already learned to see these sensations, even the most subtle and quite agitating, uh, sorry, pleasant ones as agitating. So this is, but I'm sure there's a, a large field of sensations I've yet to understand as suffering, you know, like the deeper blisses of meditation at first might seem very uh, pure and beautiful, but even those in comparison to, you know, total peace, even those are still in the field of suffering. So then the next aspects of practicing this right view a noble disciple, so now we're noble, so now the right view has become noble right view. A noble disciple considers thus, when I pursue, develop and cultivate this view, do I personally obtain serenity? Do I personally obtain quenching? And they understand this, or thus, when I pursue, develop and cultivate this view, I personally obtain serenity, I personally obtain quenching. So if it's right view, it should lead to peace. It should lead to serenity, quenching of desire. Hmm? This is the second knowledge attained by them that is noble, super mundane, and not shared by ordinary people. Then again, a noble disciple considers, is there any other recluse or Brahmin outside of the Buddha's dispensation, dispensation possessed of a view such as I possess? And they understand there is no other recluse or Brahmin outside the Buddha's dispensation possessed of a view such as I possess. This is the third knowledge attained by them that is noble, super mundane and not shared by ordinary people. So that means that somebody with right view can never go to another religion anymore because if you listen carefully to the teachings of, you know, any of the other religions, there's always a, some kind of reified sense of self in there, no matter how refined it is. You know, they may talk of like cosmic consciousness or union with God or, um, you know, what else do people say? Unconditioned awareness or, um, I don't know, Paramatma in Hindi, in, in the Hindu tradition. But the Buddha is actually saying none of that is self and that is still in the realm of being born. That's still a kind of realm Right? There's three realms. There's the human or the material realm. Then there's like the um, fine material realm or jhana realm, like the Brahmaloka. And then there's the immaterial realms. And all of those, even at the level of like the Arupa states, they're all within samsara. <clears throat> so the Buddha is actually getting you out of all. And that is what makes the difference there. <clears throat> and then... I like this one, this is really nice because I think we can all relate to this and move towards this. This is the character of a person who possesses right view. So a noble disciple considers thus, do I possess the character of a person who possesses right view? What is the character of a person who possesses right view? This is the character of a person who possesses right view. Although they may commit some kind of offense for which a means of rehabilitation has been laid down, still at once they confess, reveal and disclose it to the teacher or to wise companions in the holy life. And having done that, they enter upon restraint for the future. Just as a young tender infant lying prone at once draws back what he puts in his hand or his foot on a live coal. Oh, sorry, draws back at once when they put their hand or foot on a live coal so too that is the character of a person who possesses right view. Hmm. And that's really beautiful. 
And it's not sort of saying you've got to be perfect or you will always be perfect. You're not going to be, even as a stream entrer. But the difference will be that you won't be able to hide the slightest fault. And this is why monastic life can be very beautiful because we do have a system of um, rehabilitation, if you like, of acknowledgement. I don't want to call it confession because that's a Christian word. But we do have this, um, a bit, you know, this, uh, this structure, this safe place, if you wish, to be able to bring forward whatever it is, you know, that we're doing and, and acknowledge that to somebody senior or to somebody that we trust. And I can say for myself, this is really wonderful because I have so much respect and reverence for my teacher. There's no way I could hide anything from him, from Ajahn Brahm. So whatever it is that I do, I tell him everything, you know, because it's also really helpful for me just to check in, just to check in, like, am I still on course or not? And, you know, and, and the amount of forgiveness that such people give you, I mean, it's just like you're already pre-forgiven. He actually says you're already pre forgiven in the three time zones, past, present, and future. <laughs> but you actually are, you know, like there's no judgment there at all because they say in the text that it's, um, it's progress for one to make a mistake and then confess it. It's actually progress on the path. Yeah. So this is a really good sign that somebody's walking in the right direction. Like, are they still concealing their faults or are they able to? be aware, be mindful and have the humility to just open up, to accept, okay, I did something, I made a mistake, uh, but I'll try better next time, I'll try again. You know? And sometimes I've done something, I've told Ajahn Brahm and he says, uh, I'm already forgiven even if I do it again. <laughs> and what that does is not that you uh, do it again, it's more that you feel such respect and such a sense of trust that you're really not likely to. You know, and sometimes he said to me, oh, I'm really glad that that happened because now you'll be a better nun. And that's true, too. I'm not talking about big things, you know, I'm just talking about little things. But even if it's big things. That really is true. So I've said about right view, mundane and super mundane, and we're not even past the first page yet. Um, so I'm thinking to just finish the next small paragraph and then I'll open for questions, okay? Because I can see that someone has their hand up and maybe there'll be more discussion to come. So the last bit, this is still part of the same sutta. One makes an effort to abandon wrong view and to enter upon right view. This is one's right effort. Mindfully one abandons wrong view. Excuse me. Mindfully one enters upon and abides in right view. This is one's right, one's right mindfulness. These three states run and circle around right view. That is right view, right effort and right mindfulness. So the Buddha is just taking a small part of the Eightfold Path because all of the Eightfold Path works together in different ways, in beautiful ways. But here he's talking about how the um, effort to discern between wrong and right view is a type of right effort, right? So that was what we said in the beginning, that um, the first sort of stage of right view is being able to differentiate between wrong and right view. So that becomes your right effort, right? So you're already practicing two factors at once. And then you have to have mindfulness, right? You have to be aware enough to know, whoops, this is wrong view arising. So mindfully, one abandons that wrong view. And mindfully, one enters upon and abides in right view, and that is one's mindfulness. So these three run around right view, right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. And of course, the more we can develop mindfulness, the more quickly we can see when we've gone into wrong view. We're thinking, oh, may that person, that person really deserves to suffer. Oh, that's wrong view. <laughs> and we come back, you know, we come back into a more compassionate understanding that all beings suffer, all beings are you know, product of their causes and conditions, their life experience. And, and the right view is to, uh, yeah, to understand that and to also help to put conditions in place so that they can grow, so that they can see, you know, the error maybe of their ways. You know, I do think it's important for monastics also to speak up sometimes about these things because sometimes they'll say, oh, you're being political now talking about the situation in Burma. But for me, it's ethical. You know, and one of the beautiful things in those protests is that you have protesters on the front lines 
who will go up to the military face to face. They have their loaded guns, the protesters have a rose, and they say to those military, come on, you know, please just put, you, put it down, don't kill. You know, we're all connected. We all have a mother, we all have children. We we're, we're, come from the same country. You know, don't do something that will harm you. And I've heard reports like this, and it's so touching. It takes so much courage and strength. You know, not only are they practicing nonviolence and committed to nonviolence, they're also encouraging the military who are standing there with guns, threatening their life, to act in peaceful ways. So beautiful, no? So beautiful. So um, deep reverence to the Burmese people. <laughs> And I think it's an inspiration we can all take. So are there any questions uh, or comments people would like to say? And also please feel free to share your experience or you know, maybe how right view works for you or bits which you doubt or, or whatever it might be. So I'll leave it to my co-hosts who are doing the question time to unmute people and mention their name, please. So we've got three new co-hosts today and uh, they're very kindly learning on the job. Um, I think Emma has her hands up and I will unmute. Hello. Hi, Emma. <laughs> Hi. Um, wasn't a question, just a, a uh, comment uh, from my own practice. Um, I come from more of a Tibetan Buddhism background mm. and um, we were talking earlier about uh, rebirth and I think and having gratitude for our parents and mm. uh, how some people might struggle with that because of like you said of abusive backgrounds um something that's uh, I find interesting and I think that's helped a lot of people is because of rebirth everyone's been our parents it's like a really sort of um new way of looking at it mm -hmm. looking at other, others like because we've had so many intimate it, infinite lives that's one way even if you can't relate to or um uh, bring up that feeling of gratitude for your current parents it's it's useful to yes. look at others uh, uh, and also um when you're talking about the amount of tears that you shed um throughout all your life uh, lifetimes wasn't enough to fill up the oceans another one uh is the amount of mother's milk you've drank mm. from uh so that's just uh it's just uh i don't know if that would help anyone um mm. relate to rebirth uh, in another uh light <laughs> thank you thank you yeah 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 i think that is actually in the suttas where the buddha says that you know they've You've had basically all beings that you meet have been mothers, children, fathers, sons, you know, maybe enemies. <laughs> We've been so many things to each other. And why do we keep meeting the same people again and again in this life? Why not other people? You know, there's a reason that we're all connected. So, yeah, I think that's beautiful. I never thought it in the, of it in the context of... Um, the trauma, but just more getting into the sense of uh, what is a mother? It doesn't have to be this mother, but just those qualities of a mother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because this mother's only our mother this time around. Mm. Yeah. Thanks. That's it. Good. Um I think uh, Janaki has also the hand up. Great. I will ask to unmute. Yes. Um, I have um, two or three small questions. First one is about the book. I don't know how to get that because I live in New Zealand. Okay, you can just find that online. Um, oh, yeah, I don't yeah. want to like promote Amazon, but I'm sure they have it also. Where's it published? If I can download Wisdom, it. Wisdom Publications. So it's on our website. The name of it's on the website. So just Google yeah, yeah, that and order that. it online. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. And the second one is now we have been talking, discussing about uh, this um, Tanha. 
which is I, uh, I may be right or I may be wrong, but <clears throat> what I feel is that Tana is more or less uh, not the <clears throat> craving. Now, I mean, a pregnant mother has cravings for a certain kind of food or things like that. Ordinary people, they crave for many things, but it's the attachments that's what we should leave behind. So Tanha is what I, find, I understand uh, is, um, is attachments. So we <clears throat> let go of the attachments if we want to become free of sam samsara or free of suffering. Mm -hmm. So they are the attachments. Uh, okay. Shall I, shall I feed back on that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, please do. Okay. So literally, tanha is usually translated as craving or um, uh, desire, wanting. So in the noble truths, it is actually the tanha that's the cause of rebirth. Bhava tanha. Um, yes. Vibhava tanha and uh, karma tanha. Yeah, craving for sensuality, craving for existence and craving for non-existence. So that is craving. Upadana, attachment. Upadana is often translated as attachment, but it actually means more like grasping or clinging. Yeah. And some people say that's a stronger version of tanha, that's a stronger version of craving. But my understanding is that the two kind of go together. You can't really have craving without clinging. I mean, of course, there are different degrees, but any amount of craving... So I guess I'm disagreeing <laughs> with you. Um, any amount of craving for sensuality, you know, even just to see, to hear, to smell, to taste, to touch, all of these are reasons for rebirth. It's not that they're morally bad as such, you know, because not all of us are going to get out of all rebirth in this life. But it does call, like, as soon as there's craving to see, then you want to see. So you open your eyes and you crave for, visual forms and as long as there's that craving you will continue to recreate that sense organ in your next life because there's a desire to see a desire to smell a desire to feel to know we create those sense faculties again at the end of our life mm -hmm. so it's okay to have children most people are not going to be monks or nuns and you know the kind of um, instinct that you want to eat a certain kind of food is sometimes a, a, not a bad thing. My teacher always says they're not really the things to worry about. The thing to worry about in the beginning of the path, I think, is, um, is more the aversion because it's two sides of the same thing, but anger and aversion causes a lot more um, immediate harm, immediate threat to life. Um, but the craving will start to craving the uh, yeah thirst somebody's put it is translated also literally as thirst but i mean you know we have to think about how it actually manifests it's not that we need to go drink water but yes it's a sort of wanting to take stuff in in that sense yeah wanting to take stuff in like wanting to keep on fueling the process fueling this whole process of body and mind so it's a gradual thing it's like when I was younger, I liked going to full moon parties. And after a while, I realized that actually I prefer to meditate and not do that, you know? Or like once upon a time, I might have thought it was fun. I didn't actually think it was fun. But sometimes when I was really young, like 15, 16, I thought maybe I should drink a bit and get a bit drunk. And I'd have to hold my nose actually because it was so disgusting. I actually hated it. Um, and later, I didn't think that was fun at all. So it's not that you're losing out. It's just that you're relinquishing a lesser kind of happiness for something more sublime and that happens gradually but yeah nothing wrong with uh, I mean I never wanted children but you know I think having a child and bringing a child into into the world um, and bringing them up in a beautiful way can be an incredible practice you know an incredible practice of loving kindness and selflessness and patience so there are many ways to develop on the path but it's just a notice where we start to go into clinging and craving and how that causes the stress, that causes the contraction and the suffering. So, and the more we notice that, the more we just let go a bit. I want to just go to some question in the box. Uh, I'll have to read it first though. Um, but I see that it's about the five precepts. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, that's an easy one. So, but it's, you know, these are really relevant things. 
So about the right view, one of the five precepts is about not stealing, but sometimes I feel like the government's not being very fair with how I'm charged, capitalism, neoliberalism, etc. Then I feel like it's not wrong for me to steal, like if I don't pay for public transport. Am I still breaking the precept because it doesn't feel like taking things not given? You are still breaking a precept. And looking at it from the perspective of right view, that is because it is not your job to decide how to punish the capitalist neoliberalist society by not paying. If we understand karma, I mean, capitalism, neoliberalism isn't a person, it's, it's a, a whole culture, right? It's a whole system. Um, but, you know, if we understand that all beings are responsible for their actions and will um, either bring about happiness and well-being for themselves and others or not, then we don't really need to be involved in so-called, you know, bringing about justice or equality in that sense, right? In that sense, obviously we work for social justice. You know, we try to speak up for the marginalized. But in this sense, it's it's nothing to do with who's charging you or why. It's It's more about upholding your precepts, just doing the right thing, doing what the society understands as the right thing. Because that's not really going to harm anybody but you. It's not going to bring about positive change. You know, it's more like a rebellious teenager thinking, oh, I don't want to bother paying for this. <laughs> I'm not sure if I should say it in public, but well, <laughs> there was a period where my somebody in my family didn't pay for the train ride for like years. They used to hide in a bathroom instead. And uh, it was really ironic actually, because one day she got off the train and she actually was uh, she got off the train to this crew of TV reporters with video cameras <laughs> and they said congratulations you're the 1050 whatever person to use British Rail um, here's two free tic tickets to the cinema and some champagne <laughs> this is after all those years of not paying the train fare you know you think wow how does that work <laughs> but the thing is you can't measure karma by like material reward it's always about like your own inner integrity and i think that the fact you even asked the question shows that you know really you know really deep inside so try and find another way to um to live according to your values you know which may be the opposite of the neoliberalism maybe you can live in community in a sort of more communal way or you can share any excess that you have with people uh, homeless charities or you know you you can do things in a different way so yeah i hope that helps i'm just going to check if there's another question okay there's no more questions there so before we end, because these sessions are so quick, <laughs> uh, is there anyone who hasn't asked a question who would like to say anything now? I'm not sure if that Chanaki wants to talk again. Can I just check if there's anyone who hasn't spoken first? That's a... Okay, maybe Maxwell? Uh, it's about the, yes, the, the same question, the right will. Um, I think the, book, the, the title, the title uh, of the book itself explains it uh, to some extent. I yeah. think it's the harmony, the communal and, uh, what is it, uh, hang on, I have to. Social and communal social harmony. Social and communal harmony. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I think uh, that that itself explains the the meaning of the word uh, right view because if there's right I mean who decides what is right because it's personal it's the best one so because of that there is no particular basis for that so if you say it's harmonious or communal harmony or what yeah yeah that harmony I think is a better word to, uh, so that can understand what yeah 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 well, I think yeah okay <laughs> Yeah, I'll just um, feed back a little bit on that. And um, I would say that, yes, that's true, that one of the outcomes of right view should always be harmony. Like if it's leading to disharmony, it can't be right view. Like in that sutta, the Kasambhya Sutta, it was saying that, you know, if it's right view, it should lead to serenity. It should lead to what else was there? Serenity and more understanding, you know, it should be something that ennobles the heart. 
But it's not only that, that's a stepping stone. The reason, the, the um, reason that it's right to view, and I meant to say this in the beginning, the reason that any of these factors are right is because they're right in a certain context. They're right in the context of them leading to Nibbana. In that context, they're right. If you wanna to get to this destination, this is the right path to tread. If you wanna get into the heaven realms, yeah, it might be the right path to tread to a point, but you might prefer to go with a different tradition, you know, like a Vaita Vedanta or Christianity or, you know, Sufism or something. But if you want to get out of all suffering, then in that sense, if you want to, you know, if you want to walk on the path to awakening, then right view is right in the sense that that's the way it leads. Yeah. So it's right in the sense that it, it, it is uh, leading to the goal of, of Buddhism, of the holy life. So in that sense, it's right. It's not that we're being moralistic about things. Okay, uh, so Max. yeah, so Maxwell had a question, is that right? Yeah, yeah. I'll come back to you. Can, you. can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. All right, um, I'd just like to thank you so much for this evening oh. and for your time. Uh, I'm, I'm very new to Buddhism um, but um, I've been listening to you and to Ajahn Brahm and Ajahn Br Brahmali, and I just can't thank you all. So just thank oh, you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. That is your right view, the gratitude, <laughs> the beautiful <laughs> happiness that arises when you hear the Dhamma. So that is already your right view. <laughs> That's great. It's very nice to hear. And uh, yeah, I also have really enjoyed it. I felt I could get stuck into something a bit more gritty. Uh, and it's great for me because it's challenging as well. You know, it gets me thinking in different ways and connecting different pieces of the path. So um, I don't know how that session landed for people. I guess I also thought it was important for us to be able to relate it to our lives, but in the end, there was so much to say that I guess I took most of the oh. airtime. So <laughs> um, I guess each session might be a bit different, but I don't want to make them much longer than that because then it becomes, you know, I've got a lot of other teaching on other days as well. But please do feel free, you know, to give me your feedback anytime and uh, uh, let's make this work for everybody as best we can. So. Again, if anybody does want to keep coming or thinks they might come again, I really do recommend this book just because it's a lovely way into the suttas. And, you know, each paragraph here excerpts, they all are referenced to their source. So you can actually start to read around it as well. And then you can also ask me some challenging questions next time. So... Thank you so much. It's a really lovely group and I'm impressed that so many people came. So uh, yeah, I was going to hand over to someone to give a little two or three minute mention at the end. Hi, Venerable. Thank you so much for that. That was really interesting. What a, what a terrific start to something that's going to be, I think, our new favourite highlight of the week. Um, just to say to the community um, that this, um, this session is offered on a donation basis in the spirit of generosity. And any contribution of dana that you are able to make is always gratefully received and will help support Venerable Candles at Candles. Oh God, I can't speak now. <laughs> Sorry, physical needs and the day-to-day -day running of the current residence in Oxford, but also very excitingly leading towards the development of England's first monastery, where women can train towards full bikuni ordination. <laughs> Great. So our success depends entirely on the generosity of people who value what we're doing. So thank you so much for your ongoing support. And I'll just redrop the link in to the chat box. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, really. Thank you, all of you. I mean, I'm not sure how many are on our newsletter list, but, you know, since the start of this pandemic, it was really like, gosh, this monastery can't happen because I'm not having guests and we rented this place and now we've got all these rental bills to pay and, you know, I'm not able to like develop my community. But actually, we've developed a community online, which has been incredibly nourishing for so many of us, including myself. And you sustain me not only with food, but also the rental costs have been met. 
which is just extraordinary. And, you know, it, it makes me feel we are in a good position in the future to, um, to manage the costs of a bigger place. So hopefully we'll be able to have these kind of classes in person, but also let's see how the future unfolds. We can perhaps continue to have some Zoom sessions here and there as well to get that sort of international um, community because it's really beautiful to have such a um, diverse range of people. I really love that. And I also just want to end by thanking the new co-hosts who came on today. Um, a few of you who are here have been co-hosting for us now. So Mel and Derek are like our, part of our core team and then Shirley's been doing some co-hosting and then these Friday sessions are going to be um, co-hosted by Kelly and by Gunther and by Matthias so I'm not sure why you're not all at the top row but maybe that's just my screen but we'll get to know you anyway and I can assure you you're in good hands so uh, great thank you I feel really uplifted by reading the teachings of the Buddha and uh, and we'll continue where we left off next week. So as is the usual way with our sessions, we usually unmute people now so that if you wish, you can wave goodbye.